Unit 3a will cover forces, equilibrium, force diagrams, and Newton's laws of motion. Previously, we learned about kinematics, which was the study of motion without understanding what caused an object to start or stop moving. Now we move into the world of dynamics, where we'll talk about how forces are applied on an object to cause an object to start moving, stop moving, slow down, speed up, or continue along its path. A force is a push or pull on an object. Force is a vector, so we can draw it as an arrow, just like we did with velocity and acceleration and position. We call the object that is being acted on by a force our system, and anything that is acting on our system will be an agent that acts on that object. Here you can see a mocked up diagram where there's a skater being pushed on by two other people on the ice. We draw our forces as vector arrows, where the first person is pushing this skater to the right, and the second person is pushing this skater up. Because these are vectors and they act in two dimensions, we'll have to consider using trigonometry to break a total resultant force into its separate x and y components. In this class, we'll cover many different types of forces. Here's just a brief list of some of the forces that we'll cover, but we'll learn about more of them in class. First, we have an applied force, which is just a name for a general push or pull that is applied to an object. We also have a gravitational force, which is a pull toward the center of the Earth. A normal force is a force applied by a surface that acts perpendicular to that surface, so it will always be applied at a right angle to a surface. A tension force is a pulling force that is usually transmitted through a rope or cable. A spring force is a restoring force that is caused by either the compression or elongation of some type of spring object. A friction force is a non-conservative force, which means it takes motion or energy away from a system, and this has to be applied through contact between a surface and an object. And a buoyant force is a force that acts to lift objects upward from a fluid. So if an object is submerged in a fluid, it will experience a buoyant force. Let's just talk about a couple of these forces just so we can get used to the idea of thinking about them before we head into class. First, an applied force. This is just the most general type of force that we'll deal with in this class. If you don't know what to call a force, you don't know if it's a gravitational force or a tension force, you can call it an applied force. But usually there's something more specific. For example, in this system, we have Sonic the Hedgehog pushing up against an object here. We see that he applies a force, an applied force, against the object. So if you just have some agent that's pushing or pulling on something, you can call it an applied force. A gravitational force is a force that pulls an object toward the center of the Earth. Sometimes we'll call this force the weight force, because when we feel gravity pulling down on us, that's what causes us to feel weight. For example, this acorn could fall from a tree and be pulled toward the center of the Earth by a gravitational force. The equation for the gravitational force will always be m times g, and it will point in the negative direction. So the more mass that an object has, the stronger the force of gravity will be. Now notice that I talked about weight, and this is the first time that we've ever spoken about weight in this class. Normally we talk about mass, but weight and mass are not quite the same thing. Weight is a force. It's another name for the gravitational force. But mass is an intrinsic property that any object has, whether you're on Earth or on the moon. It's how many kilograms of stuff there are inside of an object. Whereas mass is the same on any planet or anywhere that we go in the universe, weight depends on the gravitational field that you're present in. So weight might be a little bit stronger on Earth than it is on the moon. A normal force is a force that points upward from a surface or perpendicular to any surface that is in contact with another object. So in this case, we have some puppy chow that we're putting on the table of course, the puppy child will feel a weight force or a gravitational force down, but also when it's in contact with a surface below it, that surface will push up to make sure that the object doesn't fall toward the center of the Earth. So the normal force generally will oppose the gravitational force. Tension force is a force that is applied through some medium like a rope or a cable. It will always pull because you can't push an object along by pushing a rope, but you can pull it along. So here we have an example of a mass. Of course, it feels a weight force as well down toward the center of the Earth. That's a gravitational force. But instead of having a surface below it like we did with the normal force acting on the puppy chow, now we have a rope that is pulling that object up and opposing the force of gravity that pulls it down. 
One example where you'll see a tension force in your everyday lives is actually in tendons in your body. This is why tendons are called tendons, because they have a tension force. Sometimes we'll have a lot of forces acting, and it can be useful to be more specific than just writing a force of gravity or an applied force. To do this, we're going to use something called agent object notation, which will specifically label which object is your system and which agents are acting on your system. Here in this example, we have a skydiver that's falling through the sky toward the earth, and that skydiver is feeling a gravitational force. So we put the type of force here as a subscript next to the letter F, and then we can label the agent that is doing the force, the thing that's applying the force on our system. In this case, it's the earth, because the earth pulls down with gravity. And then we label our system as the object. The object is the thing that feels the force. So here we have a force of gravity that is being applied by the earth on the skydiver, and that force of gravity will be equal to negative mg, the mass times the acceleration due to gravity. Our diagrammatic model for this unit is going to be called a free body diagram, or often I'll just call this a force diagram. To draw a force diagram, draw your system as a single point. So which object is actually feeling the forces? That you'll just draw as a point where the center of mass is located. And then any external forces outside of that system that act on that system, we will draw as arrows in the direction that those forces point. The size of these arrows should be scaled relative to the size of the force or the magnitude of the force. So a bigger force will have a bigger arrow on this force diagram, and a smaller force will have a smaller arrow. And also the direction that those forces are being applied in must also be accurate to your diagram. When we think about the skater that was being pushed to the right and up by agents one and two, we can draw a free body diagram with our skater as a single point, and then the two applied forces in their respective directions. And for these diagrams, we are gonna ignore any internal forces. So maybe this skater is pulling on her arms or something like that, but those forces are not acting from outside of our system and they won't change anything about the motion for our system. So we only talk about external forces acting. And in unit 3A, we're only gonna deal with systems that are at equilibrium. I'll talk a little bit about what that means, but in unit 3B, we're gonna move on to talk about systems that are out of equilibrium. Equilibrium essentially means that all of the external forces that act on your system will cancel out or balance out. So for unit 3A, if we have an object that's being pushed to the right, it will also have some type of force that is canceling that by pushing it to the left. We can add up all of our forces acting on our system by denoting the net force that acts on our system. This is where we add up all of the different forces in their respective directions with a plus or minus associated with them such that those forces add up to equal zero. And just like when we had two dimensional motion, we have to worry about forces that are acting only in the horizontal direction and forces that are acting only in the vertical direction. These two do not affect each other, just like when we had two dimensional motion. Equilibrium means that the forces are going to be balanced and cancel out. So this means that any system that is at equilibrium will either be not moving, it'll just be at rest, standing in place, or it could be an object that is moving with constant velocity. It's, it's still moving, but it's not accelerating at all. There's no force causing it to increase its speed in one direction, that means that the acceleration will always equal zero for a system that's at equilibrium. For example, we can think about a person standing on the ground. They feel a gravitational force pulling them down, but a normal force pushes them back up. And if we were to draw the free body diagram for this example, we would see that the gravitational force is equal to the normal force and they are in opposite directions, so they cancel out. For an object that is at rest or motionless, we call this static equilibrium. Static means an object's not moving. However, I also mentioned that we can have a system that is at constant velocity, and that could also be considered equilibrium. This situation we'll call dynamic equilibrium, because an object is moving, but it's not changing its speed. And this means that all the forces acting on the object still will add up to cancel out and give us a net force of zero in both the x and y directions. So if we have a car that's driving 60 miles an hour down the highway, it could have an applied force that is pushing it forward, 
the wheels or the engine of the car is pushing it forward. But friction with the ground is perfectly canceling out that applied force pushing it forward. This means the net force in the left and right directions cancel and we are at equilibrium with respect to X. Also, we can have a gravitational force pulling down on the object and normal forces that act up on the object such that the gravitational force cancels out when we add up all of the normal forces that are applied by each tire of the car. Here we have an object that's moving with a constant velocity, but all the forces cancel, so we're in dynamic equilibrium and we would have a net force of zero. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about Newton's laws of motion, and we'll do this more in unit 3b as well. There are three laws of motion that you need to know about. Newton's first law states that a body at rest remains at rest, or a body in motion remains in motion at constant velocity unless acted on by some kind of external force. This means that there must be a cause for an object to speed up or slow down. It won't just happen without some net force acting. For example, for a hockey puck that slides along an ice rink, we could imagine that hockey puck going on forever, an object remaining in motion at constant velocity unless acted on by an external force. But in reality, we actually have a little bit of friction between the hockey puck and the ice. This external force is what causes the object to change its motion and to not remain at constant velocity. Often, Newton's first law will be called the law of inertia because inertia is the property that keeps a body at rest or motion. The more inertia that an object has, the harder it is to get moving or to slow down. Typically, inertia is associated with the mass of an object. So you can imagine a boulder that's really hard to get moving. It has a lot of inertia. But once it gets moving, it's going to keep moving for a long time. Newton's second law of motion states that for an object that is accelerating, it will feel a non-zero net force. This means that there will be some amount of force acting on an object to cause it to accelerate. And the second law of motion essentially boils down to an equation called F equals MA, where the net force will be associated with an acceleration in a system and its mass. For example, if a child is in a wagon and is being pushed on by a non-zero net force, if that force is bigger in the right direction than it is in the left direction, then this system will experience an acceleration. We won't deal with systems that are accelerating in unit 3A, but we will in unit 3B. When I say the net force acting on a system, that means that we need to add up all of the different forces that are acting. So the net force might involve one force being added to another, being added to however many forces that are acting on your system. And you'll want to look at your free body diagram to make sure that your net force is taking into account all of the external forces that are acting on the system. We need to separate out the forces that are acting in the x direction and the y direction. So in this example, we look at our free body diagram and we see in the x direction that we have a force being applied by the adult and a force of friction that is opposing that motion. So that all happens in the x direction. In the y direction, we just have a gravitational force that pulls down, that's why it has a negative, and a normal force that pushes up, that's why it has a positive. In the x direction, the friction acted to the left, so that's negative. That's why we leave a negative in front of it. And the standard unit that we use for force is called a Newton. Isaac Newton discovered this idea of forces, and the unit was named after him after that. You can imagine pulling backward on some type of spring or something, and that spring will pull you toward it to restore it back to its original length. This is the way that modern bathroom scales work and other types of devices that feel forces. And these have all been calibrated to use units of Newtons to talk about those forces. If we look at Newton's second law of motion, which states that F equals MA, we can figure out what fundamental units are hidden away inside of one Newton. Force is measured in Newtons. If force is equal to mass times acceleration, we know mass is measured in kilograms and acceleration is measured in meters per second squared. So one Newton is actually equal to one kilogram times a meter per second squared. And when we talked about the gravitational force being like a weight, we can now compare our English units of pounds to the standard units of Newtons and a Newton ends up being about a quarter of a pound. Newton's third law states that for an object that feels a force, it will also exert an, a force against the agent that did that force. In other words, 
For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction force. We could say that the agent is doing an action, it's the thing that's exerting a force, and the object is the thing that's experiencing that action, and it's exerting a reactionary force against the agent. For example, if you're swimming underwater, we can imagine that a swimmer would push off against the wall with an applied force. However, the wall also seems to push on the swimmer with a reactionary force that will push her forward and cause her to accelerate to the left. If we designate the swimmer as our system, we can see that the buoyant force would be acting up, the gravitational force would be acting down, and that reactionary force from the wall on the swimmer's feet would cause her to accelerate to the left. We need to be really careful about designating our system within some type of boundaries. So we're just gonna consider the swimmer our system in this example, so the swimmer just feels a force from the wall. I don't care about what the wall feels from the swimmer unless I designate that as my system. Some other examples of Newton's third law include when you walk. Every time that you walk, your feet push against the ground and the ground pushes you forward. Similarly, when you drive in a car, your wheels push against the ground and the ground pushes your car forward. Another example would be like a rocket shuttle, which pushes fuel downward and that downward force would be matched by a reactionary force that pushes the rocket shuttle upward. You'll see this in all kinds of places like birds flapping their wings, helicopters pushing air down in order to push them up, a jet ski which pushes water backwards so that you can go forward, or like punching a punching bag. You can exert a force against the punching bag and the punching bag exerts a force against you. So that'll cover everything for Unit 3A. This is just our warm-up for forces, and in Unit 3B, we'll continue talking about this for systems that are out of equilibrium. I'll see you in the next one.